Hi, I'm Tim McGee, and welcome to Superstar Student. What you're about to watch is a 12-lecture series intended for students and parents on how to be a better student, be a better learner. But before I begin this lecture series, I'd like to tell a, a little story that serves as the inspiration of this entire series. I want to tell you about a student who I will name as John, who sat across the table from me along with his mother and his father. John had been a, a good student through high school and had graduated and was now in his first semester in college. John was not doing well. And I remember sitting across the table and watching John's parents. There was frustration, there was anger. And I remember in John there was shame and fear. He didn't understand why it could be that he could have been such a good student in high school and now was struggling, desperately struggling, in his first semester in college. And I remember the question his mother asked, which is really the inspiration for this series. She looked at me and she said, Mr. McGee, what went wrong? I'd like to talk for a while with you in the first lecture about what it is that we will be doing for the next 11 lectures. Before we get there, though, I want to dispense with a couple of uh, thank yous. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the school I come from, Worland High School, and the kind community of Worland who occasionally allow me to leave. I also would like to thank a student of mine who was very instrumental in this series named Anna Sopko. Many of the uh, examples that you will see actually are her work, and I'm very excited about that. Um, why exactly should you watch this tape series? I think that's a legitimate question to ask. First of all, you may be a student and to already know you're not a very good student. You know that you could be a much better student than you are. And so you will come to this series asking questions about how you can improve your study abilities. You may be a student like John, who I mentioned, who considers themselves already a good student, but maybe a little bit concerned that in the future you might not be able to do as well as you hope. The third group that I want to talk to specifically are parents. Parents are deeply concerned that their son or their daughter really do well in school. We want to be able to speak specifically to parents as well and to ask them to think about the kinds of questions they ask their son or their daughter. Now let me explain quickly how the lectures uh, lay out. There are 12 of them, 30 minutes apiece. The first 10 lectures are specifically for students. Now parents, I'm going to recommend that you watch these lectures with your son or with your daughter. Uh, it will help in understanding what I have to say in the last two lectures, which are specifically for parents. Students, you can watch those lectures if you want, but for the most part, those will be lectures for the parents. The high point of our lectures in one through 10 will be lecture eight. You can mark it down now. What we will do in the first seven lectures will be an introduction to the most important ideas about learning. And then something very exciting is gonna happen in lecture eight. In lecture eight, we are going to actually demonstrate a student research project from start to finish. So for those students who are saying, I've always wondered what it's like to be a good student and how it looks to write a good paper from start to finish, we're gonna try and do that in the eighth lecture. And I'm pretty excited about that. But now let's talk for a few seconds in our opening introductory lecture called How to Think About Learning. Let's talk about specifically why we're here and what it is we want to accomplish. I'd like to, first of all, begin, though, with a quote that I'd like for you to look at for just a second. Take a look at this. Henry Adams has said, what one knows is in youth of little moment. They know enough who know how to learn. They know enough who know how to learn. This lecture series is all about learning. That's the primary focus for us. That's really what we want to think about. But we are immediately met with an interesting problem. 
One of the early problems for us is to try to define learning. Let me give you an example of just how difficult that is. I am married and have three children. My, my middle child is a, a young boy n uh, named Mikey. Uh, Mikey wanted to learn to tie his shoes early on. He was ambitious and wanted to do well. <laughs> so I taught him how to tie his shoes. So I thought. I showed him. And he tried it. And he failed. And I showed him again. And he failed. And I showed him again. And he failed. I must have shown Mikey a thousand times how to tie his shoes. For some reason or another, he couldn't get it. He just couldn't understand it. And I would show him the same way every time. You know how they're supposed to. You're supposed to do it the same way every time, every time. Still couldn't get it. And then I remember that summer afternoon when Mikey said, all right, Dad, show me one more time. And I remember I showed it to him, and all of a sudden, he did it. Now, most of you can't remember this moment. It happened for most of us, any of us that are here who can tie shoes. This happened for us. We had to learn how to tie our shoes. He did the first thing that all of us did as well. He untied it and did it again, right? He had to make sure he hadn't forgotten. For several weeks, we found ourselves actually kind of wondering where Mikey was when we were in public. We would be in a mall. Where's Mikey? Turn around and find Mikey way back there, down the hall, bent over, tying his shoes. He had to practice to make sure that he got it there. But we say that he learned to tie his shoes, but the real question is, what happened here that for one moment allowed Mikey to be able to learn how to tie his shoes? What happened here? Now, folks, there are a lot of people who make a lot of money that can't answer that question because we're not always certain exactly what happens here when we learn. It's somewhat mysterious, if you will, which makes it difficult for us because we're talking about a, proce a process or a project in learning that is somewhat mysterious. But we do know what learning is not. Any student knows that just because I get an A in math class doesn't mean I learned math. I remember several years ago I had a student in a chemistry class in high school. I myself teach English. She was in my class talking about chemistry and I remember that she was getting some answers from her friends. I remember one of her friends told her, you know, you better probably figure out why the answers are that way. And I remember she said, I don't care, just give me the junk. And uh, she graduated, one of the top in the class, went on to university. Her first semester in college, does this sound like the story I opened with? Her first semester in college, she ends up failing chemistry. I was speaking with one of her colleagues, and I, and I asked her colleague, I said, I thought this student got an A in chemistry in high school. Uh, Mr. McGee, the student response, Mr. McGee, getting an A in chemistry doesn't mean you learn chemistry. Now we know that's true. We know that grades are not, in fact, what we call learning. And as a matter of fact, I mean, if you're only watching this course so that you can find out how to get better grades and nothing else, guys, we all know the key to getting better grades. It's simple to cheat, not get caught. It's what I call academic suicide, and it's insane. You can do it. And there are loads of students that do it. And then like John, in my opening story, find themselves at midterms their first semester of college, and guess what? You can't cheat on an essay in class essay. Uh-oh. Now what? Now what? I want to define learning as the ability to answer the question, how does this make any meaning for me? See, the problem that we have is, how do we know when we've learned something? How do we know when we've learned? See, parents, and we'll talk more about this, parents later on in lectures 11 and 12, parents assume if a young person receives a grade of A in ninth grade mathematics, they have learned mathematics, you see. Parents assume that, and it's not always true. Our question for us is to ask, how do I know when I've learned something? And I want to suggest, I know when I've learned something any time I can say the following. When new information is provided to me, any time I can say, oh, I get it, that's like something else I already know. 
Now what I'm saying here will be fundamental to understanding specifically the other ideas in especially the first seven lectures. Anytime I can connect, match new information to something I already know, I will call that learning, and here's why. Because I can use, and you'll want to underline that, that word, I want to be able to use the information. If I am in fact not using that information, then I'm not learning that information. So the challenge always for me is to be able to get information that I will use. Now I'm going to come back to that idea later because it's so significant. We will ask ourselves, how can I get information that I can then use? There's several word pictures that I can use to maybe help you understand a little of what I'm talking about here. One of them is, you know the old chemistry models that we used to have where you have a ball of clay and then the toothpick sticking out of it and then more balls of, you know, that kind of thing? Imagine for a second that the stuff that you are in possession of as knowledge for you is the ball of old of clay, the ball of old stuff as I would call it. Okay. And then the toothpicks that are coming out from the ball of old clay, any kind of new information. For me to be able to learn, I have to be able to connect the new stuff into the old stuff. Does that make sense? That's what I have to be able to do. Okay. But we have a problem, and it's best illustrated by a student of mine named Ali Smith who came up with this metaphor. She said, you know what, my problem is, is this, but let me help explain it with the word picture. And I said, okay. She said, imagine a basketball hoop. And I said, okay. And she said, a basketball hoop is my hoop of old stuff. It's the things that I know really well that I understand. I said, okay. And the basketball is what I shoot through the hoop. Every time I can shoot a basketball through the hoop, I've learned something. And I went, oh, that's great. And she said, but wait, I have a better one than that. Let me explain to you what my problem is, Mr. McGee, in math. And I said, okay. She said, I think I figured out what's wrong in math. My basketball hoop is a Nerf hoop. No Nerf hoops, the little tiny. My basketball hoop is a Nerf hoop. The new stuff I'm trying to learn, the ball that's being shot through, the Nerf hoop is a beach ball. Ah, and I went, bingo. That one works for me. See, that one works for me. I want to talk to you quickly about what it means to be a good student. I find a lot of students who I teach at the high school level have never really considered what it means to be a good student. Because oftentimes we believe that if a student is receiving good grades, they are good students. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that that's true. First of all, I want to suggest that before you can do anything, you must be something if you're going to be a good student. Now this is significant. I will have parents, for example, who will come to me and say, okay, Mr. McGee, we need to get our son, our daughter into school, a good school. Now, exactly what is it that we need to do? And they pull out a paper and pen and get ready to write. And I say, well, wait, 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 wait. Before your son or daughter does anything, they have to be something. Really what? Two things. First of all, a good student has to be honest. Now, what do I mean by that? Any time that we know that we have an academic weakness, we have to be willing to admit that. See, I have students who come in my room, I teach English, and will say, Mr. McGee, I hate to read, but I love math. And I go, that's so great. You know. You know that you hate to read? That's so great. Here's a book. Let's read. Wait, 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 Mr. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hear me. I, I, I don't read. Oh, that's great. Honesty in a student means that a student is willing to admit academic, what I'm going to call deficiencies or weaknesses. Right. Now, some students will say they don't care. Have you heard this one before? Hey, man, you better start doing your math. You know, you're not going to do very well in the SAT. I don't care. Hey, you know, you probably should start learning how to read because I don't care. 
I've taught students enough to understand one thing, if I understand anything, and that is students really do care about learning. They do. When a student tells me I don't care, that's code language for help. That's what that means to me. When a student says I don't care, that's code language. It means I need help. Honesty means a student understands they have academic weaknesses. But I have a lot of students who like to kind of parade around their academic weaknesses. They will, in fact, sometimes say, you know, I'm a really lousy student in mathematics, as if somehow that's something to be proud of. Good students, number two, are courageous. What I mean by that? Once they know an academic weakness, they're capable of having the courage to do something about it. And that means work. That's courage. The challenge is to know how to fix academic weaknesses. Guys, that's why we're here. That's the reason that you will watch this lecture series. We want to know how to fix academic weaknesses. If you will, maybe we're looking for a good method, something that will help us be able to fix our academic weaknesses. Once we admit we've got problems, we're halfway there, because then we can finally begin to try and fix our problems. But how do I get there? That's what this series is all about. I like to think about it, though, with word pictures that for most students make sense because they are either athletes themselves or they know about athletics. See, we are familiar with how important it is for athletes to train. If a student wants to win, they know they have to train. Now, there's something very interesting to me about this. I can talk to a junior in high school right before their summer, right before their senior year, and I will ask them, you're an athlete, right? Yes, I am an athlete. You, uh, you are going to uh, participate in sports in the fall, is that correct? Yes, I am. It's going to be exciting. We'll try and win a state championship. Oh, so you're going to try and do some things over the summer, maybe to prepare. Oh, absolutely. Really, what kinds of things are you going to try and do? Well, you know, the normal things. I'm going to work out, I'm going to run, I'm going to lift weights. I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure that I'm the best athlete. Okay, that's what you say you're going to do. Of course, every athlete knows if they don't train, they don't win. At the end of the summer, I will oftentimes see this student again and will ask them, so at the beginning of the summer, you said you were going to train. Did you train? Did you get up every morning and go to the weight room? Well, I started, but there were uh, you know, other... Okay, well, did you run? You said that was it. Well, you know, I just didn't have enough time. See, we know something. Athletes understand they have to train if they're going to win. Years ago, I remember playing for a coach who was a strong disciplinarian, and he had a sign in the locker room, didn't allow anything else on the wall, this was the sign that we had to look at when he was yelling at us in halftime and we didn't want to look at him and so we would look over his shoulder and there would be this sign right there for us to read. When we went out onto the floor, we had to reach up and touch the sign. It was an old one. And every time I think about what makes good students, I think about this sign. And throughout this lecture series, I would like for you to go back to what I'm about to say. On the wall it said, somewhere, he is out there training while I am not. And when we meet, he will win. Somewhere he's out there training while I am not. And when we meet, he will win. See, I've argued for a long time that we in America ought to have the very best students in the world because we have the best athletes in the world. We understand something so well. If you don't train, you don't win. Now, I don't understand why it is in the school where I teach that a guy can go down a floor, can go between his legs, drive to the hoop, slam dunk, and he's the hero of the school, hero of the school. But the same student can go into the library to do a research project, and all of a sudden, he's the school nerd. 
It's kind of strange, isn't it? If you think about it, it's kind of strange. All of the stuff a good athlete does is the same kind of things that we're going to do when we study. All of the stuff a good music student does is the same thing we're going to do to be a good student. Good music students understand they have to practice if they're going to do well. They understand it. So our challenge is to think of studies the way that we think about athletics, music. How about this one? Many of you are really concerned about your uh, SAT, ACT preparation. That may even be one of the reasons why you are watching this series. Let's understand for a second that the SAT, ACT is a reading test. But it's not just any reading test. It's a three-hour reading test of material you've not seen before under timed conditions with a lot writing on the line. If you're going to do well at all on the SAT, you've got to be a reader, which is one of the primary reasons so many students struggle with the test. They don't read. We will talk in this lecture series about why it is important that we really do know how to read. So this is our project. This is what we wish to accomplish in our lecture series. For the first seven lectures, we will want to address specifically this approach that I spoke about earlier. We will want to have a study approach which answers the question, how can I connect new stuff to old stuff? At the eighth lecture, we'll want to demonstrate specifically how all of this can be put together. In the eighth lecture as well, we hopefully will answer some questions that you have about how do I go to the library get some information, and compile it in the form of a paper so that it makes sense, because that's always tough. In the ninth and 10th lecture, we will talk specifically about social issues in school. Going to school is more than just studies. Being a good student has a lot more to do than just getting good grades, and even learning in the classroom. There's a lot of other learning that takes place in schools, and we'll talk about that. And then in the final two lectures, we'll talk with parents. What can I do? to help my son or daughter do it better. I want to be good help. But the only thing I know to do when they come in in the evenings is to say, hi, honey, how was your day at school? What's a poor student going to say every time? Great, no problems, see you later. And then all of a sudden report card time comes and parents are wondering, what, what went wrong? Now what are we going to do? Hopefully we will address some of those issues in the last two lectures. But I want to finish with what, for me anyway, is a great way to think about learning. Years ago, I needed to come up with one learning experience that most of my students understood really well. Because I am convinced most high school and college students and beyond have forgotten what it feels like to learn something for the first time. We have to somehow recapture what that feels like if we're ever going to be the student we want to be. So I want to tell you real briefly about how my daughter Ashley learned how to ride her bike, which for most of us was an important learning experience, one of the first really important ones for us. It predates our learning how to drive, but it is an important one for any number of reasons. I brought the bike home for my daughter and had training wheels on the back, like most bikes have when they're new and they're for children. And my daughter wanted to know, what are those training wheels for? And I said, honey, they're to help you learn how to ride your bike. They're, they're, they're good for you. And she said, take them off. I don't want them. They're ugly. My friends don't have bikes with those stupid looking wheels. And I explained to her the need for them. She got onto the bike and she got ready to fall. And of course, why is it we do that? We grab hold tighter the moment we're about ready to fall instead of letting go to protect. She but the wheels caught her, and she was, oh, that's great. My daughter became a great expert bike rider on training. Awesome, awesome. But I remember the afternoon she came in to me. It was in the middle of the summer, and she said, you know, Dad, those wheels on the back, I think it's time we take them off. I went, okay, okay, sure, we can do that. And so I, uh, I, I took them off for her. When she wasn't home, she came home, and I was standing out there in the driveway next to the bike going, okay, honey, 
This is it. Now let's learn how to ride our bike. I can remember the look on her face. Maybe some of you can remember what that was like the first time you looked at your bike without training wheels. Think for a moment what that looked. The bike looked so foreign. And she was scared. I said, honey, why are you scared? You've been riding this bike on training wheels for a long, long time. You're, you can do this. She got onto the bike real slowly as a foreign object almost, like she'd never seen this bike before. And she was shaking. She was scared. And I remember that she said, Dad, I don't think I can do this. Most learning experiences, we kind of start out that way, don't we? I don't know how I can do this. And I said, hon, you can do this. Now, let's go. I put her on the bike, the way maybe some of you were taught how to ride a bike. I held onto the back into the handlebars and started to walk along. When I noticed something, she wasn't pedaling. I said, uh, honey, <laughs> if you're going to ride a bike, you have to pedal. She knew that, but she was afraid. And there she was pedaling as I was pushing and walking, and she started to go. And then all of a sudden, we were going faster, and I had to jog, and we were going a little faster. And all of a sudden, she turned to tell me she was riding her bike. And I was, of course, back behind going, hey, go, go, go. Right. She was riding. And then, uh, yeah, we know this part, don't we? And then the curve, right? Oh, uh, yeah. And then the curve. And she did. She knew how to use her brakes. She still hit the curve. Over the handlebar she goes. She slams onto the ground. Oh, she is torqued really torque. I came running up to her and I said, oh, honey, that was great. That was great. Let's get back on it again. And she was mad. She wasn't mad at herself for not using her brakes, even though she knew how to do that. She wasn't mad at the bike for, for wrecking. She was mad at me. Yes, she was mad at me. Stupid jerk dad. I remember that's what she, stupid jerk dad, you know. Uh, how could you make me do this? And I I said to her, I said, hon, that was awesome. This is the way we learn how to ride bikes. Come on, let's get back up and let's do it again. Well, she didn't want to that day. And uh, she didn't want to the next day. But she finally did. The way most of you learn how to ride a bike. She got on the bike. She did it again and again and again. Now, what do we learn from this whole story? And why do I tell it? First of all, there are two things always involved in any learning experience, and we can't forget, ever. I will come back to it over and over in this lecture series. One, all learning experiences involve fear. You will hear no gimmicks in these lecture series. You will hear me give you again and again and again words of encouragement to deal with fear. Because most of the time, a student at the junior level afraid of mathematics isn't going to take a mathematics course if they don't have to. If I haven't started studying a foreign language by the time I'm a senior in high school, most of us aren't going to run to a class like that because we are afraid. Because number two, all learning experiences involve pain. My daughter knew she would fall. I know very few students who ever learned how to ride a bike who didn't fall. So. You're going to experience pain. It's going to be difficult for you at times. There is no easy way to success. You have to be able to work hard, and you have to be able to overcome fear, and obviously pain is coming, because it's inevitably coming for you. The real challenge then for us is to be able to look at our studies with some kind of focus and to say, what are the things I really need to work on? And specifically, how do I fix those things? Okay. Riding a bike is something you learn how to do. That is important because sometimes, and I may be speaking to specifically some of you now, we can sit in classrooms and convince ourselves that we can't do it. I've heard students say that to me before. You don't understand what you do. I can't do calculus. I can't do history. The bike story tells us that we can 
be successful. But why did it take? It takes honesty. And it takes courage. And it takes hard work. And it takes an approach. When we come back next lecture, I want to introduce this approach. One approach that for many of the students I teach is a great way to get to learning, the connecting of new things to old things. But I want to finish with one question for those of you who are still wondering if maybe you should keep watching. If you don't start now to improve your learning, when? When are you going to begin? Now is the time. Let's go to work. Hi, and welcome back. This is lecture two of our series, and uh, we will be talking now for the next few minutes about a study approach that I have found works for many of my students that I teach. And then at the conclusion of this lecture, we want to talk about study habits. As I spoke on the first lecture, I said that study has to be understood as training or work, but it's got to be good work. Take a look at what Teddy Roosevelt had to say about work. I like this quote. Watch this. He says, far and away, the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. I like that quote because it speaks specifically to what we're going to talk about now for the next few minutes. I want to talk about, first of all, though, the key to good study, okay? And then we're going to talk about one study approach that I have found works quite well that I call learning journals. The key to good study is to show up prepared. Think about this for a second. If I were to come to you and say, as you leave this room in a few minutes, there's going to be your friend standing on the outside of the room and they're going to jump out and try and scare you. Okay? And then you were to walk out of the room and somebody did jump out and try and scare you. You probably wouldn't jump as badly because you were prepared. You knew that they were coming. We want to use the same basic approach in our study habits. So the first thing we want to say is that good students are prepared students. They know coming into class what to be prepared for. Let me give you an example of how, for many of my students, they, have, they find themselves in class sometimes struggling. Imagine a math class for a second. Everyone comes in, sits down, the bell rings, whatever uh, kinds of things have to happen at the beginning of the hour, and then the math teacher says, we're going to introduce a concept today. Everyone take a look. And then she turns around to the board and she begins to work through an equation. First you do this, then 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 you do this, and then she spins around and says, any questions? And of course, everyone just is stunned by the concept. Maybe there's one person who goes, can I see that one more time? And speaks for the rest of the group. And she goes, okay, watch close. Right. That's always what they like to say, isn't it? Watch close. Okay, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Any questions? Fine. Everybody take out paper and let's go to homework, page 103, odd questions. And then what happens? The teacher sits down at the desk and all the students start looking around. Right? Okay, finally, you might find one or two people there who have a clue what's going on. Most students, this will be central to our understanding of study preparation, most students at the end of a lecture only know what they don't know. Think about what I just said and it'll make sense. Most students only know they have no idea what they just saw. So they go home that evening to try and sit down and do homework and guess what? If they didn't understand it in class, there's a good chance they may not understand it at home either. They come back the next day, homework's only halfway finished, and guess what? Teacher has a new concept, new equation, ready to throw at them for the next day. We start the whole thing all over again. It is no wonder that so many students find themselves really struggling to understand concepts 
in math, in science, in physics, in calculus. Our challenge is to be prepared, which is to say, we always want to show up to class with some idea of what will be presented. Okay? We always want to show up to class with some idea of the information which is going to be presented. We never want to show up to class unprepared. Another major question for students, I'm asked this one all the time, by parents as well. Now, Mr. McGee, exactly what kind of notes should I be taking during class? When the teacher is going on and on and on, should I be taking notes? And for anyone who's ever visited a classroom, you see if you'll stand in the front of the classroom while the teacher is teaching, lots of heads like this. Everyone is taking notes. One of our challenges is going to be always in our class to use the old uh, basketball, soccer, hockey uh, saying, anytime I'm dribbling, I always keep my head what? Up. Yeah, yeah. Good students in class always have their head up. So we want to answer that question. What types of specific things should I be taking down? Should I be writing down everything the instructor says? Should I uh, be writing down something? What things? It's just a few things. I mean, how should I do that? We'll want to talk about that as well. I think the other thing that I want to point out about good study habits is that many of my students believe that some students were just born to be good students. They were born smarter than other students, and therefore that is why they seem to understand concepts and do better in class and get better grades. Now, there, I don't want to take away from the notion of intelligence. We certainly know that some students grasp onto concepts. Uh, back to my Mikey and his tying his shoes example, there are some kids who the first or second time they're shown, they get it, right? But I want to suggest that being a good student has less to do with just natural intelligence and more to do with the approach one uses, okay? A lot of times I have students who their mom or their dad will simply say, you just need to study more, study harder, study harder. And of course in this lecture series we're going to argue that instead of studying harder, as many people have said about good study habits, we want to study smarter. Does that make sense? We want to spend more time with an approach that works. We may find, and I'm going to argue this through the next several lectures, we may find we actually spend less time given to our studies if we have an approach that works well. And our goal here is to find an approach that works and then do it the same way over and over and over. Get a good approach and then use it. But there is no one study approach that works for all students. I want to make this very clear. There is no real one way that you can go into class and derive information to exclude all others because we all connect stuff differently. So the real key for me in a study approach is the answer to the simple question, does my study approach help me learn? Does my study approach help me learn? You could, if you wanted to, take a few seconds now and you could think about how you study and you could ask yourself that simple question. You know, is it in fact the case, the approach that I take most of the time, does it in fact help me connect new things to old things to make meaning, if you will. And if my answer is, oh, yeah, I, don't, I, you know, I don't think so, I think maybe my, my approach has some problems, I want to introduce now one study approach that can allow for you to connect new things to old things. And hopefully this is something that will make sense for you. Now what I'd like for you to do for the next several lectures is just listen to the information as it's presented and you can decide if this is something that you would like to try in school. Many of my students try this approach and it is a way for them to connect new stuff to old stuff and it seems to help. The learning journals approach is what I call this and it is a way for a student to be prepared. It is a way for a student to know specifically. And I will be very specific when I tell you what I think you should be writing down, okay? In class for notes and it is as well a way to prepare for exams which for many students is the major problem, isn't it? We can know the information really well and all of a sudden we come into class and we're just shelled by whatever instrument or test they throw at us. And then our self-confidence, our academic confidence, as I like to talk about it, begins to drop because we find ourselves really struggling on exams. We will talk about all of these through this approach. Now, I'm gonna come back and explain in more detail these three steps to the learning journey, okay? And all I wanna do now is just introduce it. First of all, 
Step number one, we will always make sure that we come to class having read the material to be presented. Before we come to class, we will have read the material. Step number two of learning journals is what we do during class, taking notes. And step number three is what we do after class as we prepare for examination. Okay? So there are three simple steps. Now, hey, listen. I really believe that if you have an approach that is majorly tiresome and overwhelming, you probably won't try it and use it. One of the reasons that I teach this approach is that I really do find this is an approach that a student will try. Now, you've got to give it some time. If you don't give it enough time, you will find yourself quitting before it ever allows, the approach allows uh, you to kind of learn how to use it. So that's going to be a major challenge for you. But I want to introduce it. Approach. And if you feel like this makes sense, give it a shot. Step number one. First of all, what we do before we come to class. We always begin with a three-ring notebook approach. I'm going to come back at the end of this lecture to talk about how we should study. And one of the important things is we've got to have a good approach. We need to make sure that what we have is some way to be organized. Good students are organized students for the most part, and so I recommend a three-ring notebook approach. You begin with a piece of paper that has a line down the middle of the page. Simple sheet of notebook paper, line down the middle of the page. On the left-hand side of the page, you will be taking what we call pre-class reading notes. Now follow exactly what this is. Pre-class reading notes are any notes that you would take before you come to class. Most academic classes, most academic classes will find themselves using a textbook. We will be reading that textbook before we come to class and taking notes. Okay? We will do what we call log in always because we want to make sure that we keep our notes organized. And we want to put basic information there, like uh, the date that we are taking these notes and the section to be covered from the textbook, okay? Then we will t put down any kinds of important information. Now, this is the key. We will make sure that we are taking our pre-class reading notes with red ink. Ready. I will explain in more detail why in the next lecture, okay? but we will take our pre-class reading notes before class in red ink. So in other words, if the math teacher that I was just uh, um, showing you up here is going to cover concept chapter 7.1, I will read 7.1 the night before I come to class. And I will take my notes on the left-hand side of the page. Okay? Step two. During class, work during class, is done on the right-hand side of the page. We will, uh, as well, remember that uh, basketball rule of having our head up. So one of the early on goals for us when we come into class is to take as few notes as possible. That's a key. We want to, we want to write as little as possible during class. We want to keep our head up. We want to watch. We want to listen. We want to be able to trust ourselves. We come into class, though, having already read section 7.1 of the math textbook. So as the teacher begins to go through that operation, as I was pushing this, thing, this, thing, this, we've already heard it once. We've already heard it once. So is this information now new information for us or old information? Ah, see how our definition of learning starts to work here? It's not new for us anymore. And as we are watching it up there on the board, we've already read this once. Where are those notes? On the left-hand side of the page. During class, we're on the right-hand side of the page. Now, however, we're in blue or black ink, not ready. We're looking for only two pieces of information. For those of you who are watching this lecture series wondering, how do I take good class notes? Now I'll answer the question for you. We're looking for two pieces of information. One, we want to know what match information, what I call match information, the instructor is given. A match is simply any time the instructor presents information that is in the textbook. If the textbook said it, and the instructor says it, we call that a match. And a lot of times what students will do is they will actually circle in blue or black ink over on the left-hand side. They will find themselves circling the information, recognizing it as a match. Okay? Any information 
the instructor presents that I know is in the textbook. That's the first thing I'm always looking for when I'm taking notes in class. Number two, any information that is new information. In other words, any information that is not in the textbook, right? Anything the instructor would say that's not in the textbook, obviously I'm going to get that down because I have no other place to go and get that information. One of the major mistakes lots of college students and, and advanced high school students will make in upper level courses is they do not read their textbook before they come to class and they don't take very good notes in class and they assume, well, whatever the instructor's saying in the biology class, I'll just read the textbook a couple of nights before the test so that I can get it all. But guess what? Lots of instructors, especially at university, will lecture on information outside the textbook. So here I am thinking I'm going to be able to just kind of cram the last two nights by sitting down and reading a lot of information. I get all that information and memorize all of it and still get a C plus on the test. Why? Because the examination covered, yeah, lots of new information that I never got into my notes. Think about this for a second and maybe this will make sense too. How will I know it's new information unless I've read the book before I come to class? See, I won't know. I won't know when the instructor is giving me new information as opposed to the old match information unless I've read the textbook. See? So this is why we will want to make sure that we always read our textbook before we come to class taking notes in red. And then we will come to class taking notes in blue or black ink looking for match information and new information. Step number three. Now think about this for a second. This is a fun question for me to ask students. If I know what match material has been covered in class, that information that was in the textbook and the teacher also covered it, and I know that information, I understand. If I know and I understand the new information that the instructor has given to me during the class session, what can the instructor ask me on the examination that I can't answer? Think about that. If I know what match information has been hit, and I know what new information, what do you think are the odds that if the textbook says it and the teacher says it, it's going to end up on the exam? What do you think the odds are there? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing some of your faces, right? Yeah, we know that. That makes sense. Anything the textbook says and the instructor says, obviously going to probably end up on an exam somewhere, right? And then, of course, anything that the instructor might take their time outside of the textbook to show me, what are the odds that's going to end up on the exam? When we go in, number three, learning journal three to prepare for an exam, when we go in to prepare for an exam, then we want to take the other side of our notebook page. As your notebook page is laid out there, on the one hand side will be your learning journals, pre-reading, learning journals, note taking, and then in your notebook there will be another side of the page on the, uh, on the, on the exact double page spread, and over there we will take our exam prep notes. Now the most important thing that we will be doing there is to try to find ways to connect new stuff to old stuff to make sure that we're doing exam preparation correctly. And I'll be talking in more detail about how you do that. How do you get ready for an exam? Because there are different types of exams, aren't they? Sure, there are, yeah. By the way, a lot of my students have found that they like to continue with the pin color coding um, concept and they won't do a lot of their exam prep in green ink so that they do their pre-class reading and reading, their note-taking during class in blue or black ink, and then their exam preparation is all done in green ink. So anything on any of the training journal pages that's green notes, for them, that's exam prep. This is the stuff that for sure will probably appear, especially if you're in a class with a teacher that gives like study guides and that kind of thing, so that you have some idea of really what's there, okay? But we want to say something finally about exam prep. We'll come back to this concept. One of the most important things about learning happens during the exam and after the exam. We will never, ever go on to another concept until we learn the prior concept. This is a promise good students make to themselves. If I am in math chapter 7.1 and I have a test over 7.1, I want to come in to take the test really wanting to know, did I learn this information? By the way, that's why good students never cheat. Even if you were to lay the key right there next to them, they have to know, did I learn this information? Because I'm not going on to the next concept 
until I have the, the early concept understood. Because, for example, in mathematics, if you can imagine a staircase going up, we understand that you have chapter one, which takes us to chapter two, which takes us to chapter three. And if I don't get chapter one concept, I may not understand chapter three concept, right? So I have to make sure that I understand the learning. Exams, then, are the place where I make sure I learn. And so if I didn't get a concept, I'm going in and getting help. I've got to get a tutor to help me understand it. I don't say, oh, well, I guess I wasn't meant to understand chapter 7.1. No, 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 no. We won't do that, ever. We always will make sure we understand a concept before we go on to the new one. That's an introduction to learning journeys. Now I want to talk real briefly in the last few minutes that I have about how good students study. What's interesting to me about this is um, a lot of times I find many students who uh, don't actually do much homework. Imagine this for a second. If I were to have a job at a local hamburger stand and I were to tell my friends, I got this job. This is so great. I'm going to finally get a job. I'm going to go make some money. You got a job when you start? Uh, next, next Wednesday, I got to start in the afternoon, 4 o'clock. Oh, okay. Well, good luck. And then my friend comes over to my house on Wednesday at 4.30 and there I am sitting watching television. And they say, I thought you had a job. Oh, yeah, I got a job. Great job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some money. I've got to buy a new car. Uh, I thought you said your job started today. Right. Today's Wednesday, 4 o'clock. It's 4.30. You mean i got to go to that job? I, I, you mean I have to actually attend? i got to go and work there. Is that what you're telling? Right. That's called a job. Some of you are laughing, but I have students. And I'll ask, you got a math class? Got a math class. You got homework? Got homework. Go home and visit them that evening. They're, they're not doing their math homework. I thought, I, thought, I thought you had math homework. I've got math homework. Well, you've got to do it. I've got to do math homework? Yes. Good students understand they have to do their homework. They have to. <laughs> but this makes sense, guys. We've already said this once. If I play a sport, I've got to train. If I play an instrument, I've got to practice. You know, if I'm in school, I've got to do my homework. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk about, for a few reasons, uh, a few suggestions about study habits. The way I like to think about it is when I should study, where I should study, how I should study. Okay? Now, what I'm going to give to you now are simply suggestions. I'd like you to think about how you study and then hear what I'm suggesting and see if maybe you might want to try some of these ideas to see if it improves your ability to study. First of all, to the issue of when I should study. When do you think most students study? Lots of research has shown most students do their homework, their primary homework, at what time of the day would you imagine? Yeah, you're right. In the late afternoon, evening. This is when most students do their primary study. I'd like you to think about for a second, though, and picture, if you will, the mind as a blackboard or a square piece of paper. And imagine that every Thing that happens through the course of your day is like a little X on that blackboard. Now, if you wake up in the morning and you've had good sleep, your mind is nice and fresh and clear. The blackboard is clear. Everything that happens to you, every sound, every discussion, is like an X on that board. And so you go through your whole day. You go through your school day. Then after school, you have your whatever it is you do, job or work or, or, uh, or sports or whatever it is, your club activities. And then you go through your evening. And finally, you sit down to do your homework. How much of the board space is left? How much of your mind is left? Most students find that when they sit down to do homework, one of their major problems is they fall asleep or they can't concentrate or they can't focus. I want to suggest that if you study in the late evening you, and, and you find yourself falling asleep and that kind of thing, losing concentration, you may want to try something. What about getting up in the morning and trying study in the morning? Now, for some students, they say, you know, I'm not an early riser. Now, wait a minute. It might be that you could train yourself to be an early riser. Remember our bike story. It's not always going to be easy. But when do I want to put especially the things I'd like to remember into my brain? When my board is completely filled up with X's or in the early morning when it's brand new? One of the inside hits a lot of students learn is that they find themselves at the early morning hours doing their learning journals, stage one, that pre-class reading. 
And then a lot of times they find themselves doing their exam prep work in the evening time after the class. Does that make sense? So you are doing the important reading that you're wanting to remember in the early morning before you come to school. I recommend that you try this. Get up 30 minutes early for the next two weeks than you normally do and sit down and try and do some reading and study. One of the things you will be surprised about is that you don't have to give as much time to your reading. Your mind is able to grasp because it's not as tired. Okay? What about this issue of where I should study? There's been a whole lot you know, said about this in the media. The big thing for me and my recommendation is you've got to have silence. You cannot listen to music with lyrics and at the same time try and do reading. Your brain is doing two different things. Whether you understand that your brain is doing this or not, if you know the lyrics, your brain is saying those lyrics while you're trying to read. You're asking your brain to do two things at the same time. It's almost impossible for your mind to do this. So I strongly recommend that you find some place where there's silence, obviously a table. Guys, we don't want to study on our bed. Okay? Our beds are for sleeping. And for students to find themselves taking notes on bed and then falling asleep, it's a pretty natural thing. Find a study area that is, this is key here, consistent. It's a good suggestion. Find a consistent place to go back. The other thing I would recommend as well is that you have good lighting for yourself and that you have proper resources available. In other words, it's kind of a pain if I'm reading in my English and I hit a word I don't understand and I've got to get up and go get the dictionary, but the dictionary is through three rooms in the house, you know, and we've got it in the living room. And then I, oh, what are you watching on TV anyway? What's going And then I'm down, and then all of a sudden I've forgotten that I was supposed to be doing my homework. Have your resources there around you so that you know specifically what types of things you want to, uh, you know, study and you want to look at and that kind of thing. So these are recommendations for you as to where. I would suggest that you sit down, you know, I'm speaking specifically to students, you sit down with your folks and say, look, I think I probably need a place that I can study. Can we get a small desk for me? Can I have some good lighting? Can there be a place of silence? And let me talk for a moment about this issue of silence. I believe that most parents really do want their sons and daughters to succeed in school. A lot of times they just don't know how to help that happen. You as a student, if you find yourself not having silence in the house, you might go to your parents and say, look, you know, is there any way that from 6 until 6.30 on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, that we could have a kind of rule of no television radio in the house and everyone has to be kind of quiet so that we can just do homework? Is that something we could do so it gets quiet? You'll be surprised. Maybe your parents will say, great idea, great idea. Let's try that for a week and just see if that helps. Of course, if you can't do your studies in your house, you go somewhere else where there's silence. To a library, to a reading room, you try and find some other place that maybe you can get some help or some silence and the resources there available for you as well. Does that make sense? And now to this last thing about how. How should I study? What's the approach that I should take? Well, first of all, I want to make a point. We always want to begin with our toughest homework first. We don't want to wait and push it to the last. This is especially true if you're going to do your homework in the evening. Because what typically happens, I'm really good in math, but boy, that English short story, I don't know, oh, that one's a hard one. And so I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do my math real fast. I start at 8, I'm done by 8.45, and then all of a sudden I look up and I say, boy, I got that story. So I'm going to go and I'm going to take a break and I'm going to go watch TV. And I, and, and, and so. so I recommend that when you sit down to do your studies, you make a list for yourself of what for you is the homework of the evening. I'll talk about master schedules later, okay? And then you have your to-do list of studies. Put your most challenging concept first and get it done, okay? If you're using the learning journals approach, it's altogether possible that a lot of times you will have your homework done in class. Go back to my math example I started with at the top of this lecture. There's the teacher going, do you get this, do, 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 then you do this, then you do this. Go to the homework. What do most students do? They try to figure out in the next 40 minutes or 30 minutes that are provided what the teacher just said. In other words, are you ready for this? They're doing their pre-class reading during class. Do you understand what I'm just saying? In other words, they're trying to figure out the concept during class. If you've done your pre-class reading before you come to class, when you're sitting down there, you're listening to the instructor go through the information, 98% of the time when the instructor is finished, 
you're going to understand the concept well enough, you can go immediately to the homework. Lots of top students finish most of their homework before they ever come home, which parents, by the way, is a, a, a major reason um, that they are sometimes stunned. Honey, don't you have any homework? No, I got it all done. Well, that's legitimate for a lot of students. If you take a, a proper approach, a lot of times you will have your homework done, which is great. So every evening, then, of course, your homework is to do your pre-class reading for it the next day or date. Okay? But I want to make a recommendation here. My recommendation is you never want to study longer than 15 minutes at a time. The key here for us is the word focus. We want to focus completely focused. If you ever watch a baseball player getting ready to take a pitch, how do they look? They look very focused, like they're ready to hit the ball. That's how we want to sit down to do our studies. We want to be very focused. But here's the problem for a lot of students. They realize they've got a lot of homework left. And so they find themselves saying, gee, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, I can do this for this long amount of time. My recommendation is set your watch for 15 minutes and say, I'm going to study hard for 15 minutes. I'm going to take a break and then take a break. Go away for a few minutes, come back, sit down, 15 more minutes. This is what we call studying in small chunks of time. And it, and it has proved to be very successful, okay? I think the other thing we have to say is that we don't want any interruptions in our study. And I've already kind of mentioned that. Okay, so what have we done? We've talked about a study approach called learning journals, which I'm going to now talk more about in the next lesson. And we've talked about what it means to be good students in terms of our study habits. The real challenge for us is to begin to do our homework because if we don't start doing our homework, we're never going to be the students that we want to be. Hi, and welcome back to Lecture 3. We're going to be talking about active reading in this lecture, and more particularly, what pre-class learning journals are like. We're also going to talk about how important it is to know your textbook, and then we'll as well spend some time at the end of this lecture talking about reading improvement. Now, one of the things I want to, to do on this lecture is to show you specifically what pre-class reading learning journals look like. And, um, and, and I hope that some of the graphics that we show to you will help you understand better just what we're talking about. But first of all, I, I want to talk about reading in general. Because you see, sometimes I fear that sometimes students don't completely understand what they're doing when they read, especially when we read in school. There are really two types of reading, and we want to make sure that we understand both types. The first type of reading is what we will call social reading, okay? This is what most students do for basic survival. There's also, I suppose, another good reason for social reading. Take a look at what C.S. Lewis said about social reading or reading in general and why we read in the first place. He says, we read to be reminded we are not alone. I like that quote. Social reading oftentimes for us is the reading that we do for survival purposes. For, so, for those of us who have read most of our lives, maybe we can't imagine what it would be like to not be able to read, to go to the grocery store and be unable to read, to try and drive through a downtown city area and be unable to read the signs. So for those of us who do uh, normal reading, this is what we would call social reading. This is, of course, picking up the Sports Illustrated and reading it, picking up the People magazine and reading it, and that kind of thing. The other kind of reading is what we call academic reading. This is reading with a purpose. This is reading to respond. Here, I like to think about what John Locke had to say about reading. Take a look at what John Locke says in this quote. He says, Reading furnishes the mind only with materials for knowledge. It is thinking that makes what we read ours. Active reading is something far different 
from social reading. Here, we're reading specifically for a purpose. We have some idea that something is coming down the line. Think about it this way. When I'm reading a Stephen King novel, and I get 15 pages into the novel, I don't pause and go, oh, wait, what was the name of that gas station attendant guy? I better go back and look. But no, no, no. See, I'm reading for a different purpose. However, when I read my history, and I get to the end of a passage, I may want to go back and ask myself, now what was that key concept for me? This is what we call active reading. I like to think about active reading as well as carrying on a dialogue with the writer. In other words, when we normally carry on conversations with people, we lean forward, we listen to the, what they have to say, they listen to what we have to say, we agree with them, we nod our heads. Sometimes if they say something we don't understand, we question it, we go, well, I didn't quite understand that. That's what we're doing when we read actively as well. I, I like to consider it almost like a treasure hunt as well when we read actively. We are looking for information, and I will say this several times, looking for information that I can use. Once I have that information, then I can use it. Okay? Does that make sense? And that is really the challenge for us. We want to be able to know how we're reading. Because here's one of the major problems many of my students have when they are reading history. They read instead of read. Do you understand? They read their history book instead of read their history book. So, for example, they will go home and they will scan their history book the way that maybe they would scan an article out of Sports Illustrated. They come back the next day and bomb the quiz. When the teacher says, oh, you didn't read your textbook, they say, but I did read. Well, the truth is they read, they just didn't read. You understand? We have to learn how to read academically, what we will call actively. And our challenge then is to be able to read with a purpose, to be able to come away with some information that I can use. Now, we also will call this kind of active reading annotation. Now, this is a maybe new word for some of you, and so I want to explain it for a few minutes to make sure that you understand. Annotation, active reading, two types. There's what we can do internally, which means inside of the book. There is what we can do externally, which is any kind of note-taking that is outside the book. We understand that we will always be doing both of these if we can, if we can. First of all, to internal annotation. When we are young, we are told repeatedly, don't write in your books. Uh, when we're a child and we pick up the crown and then we also pick up the family uh, Bible and we start coloring in it, we're immediately told, don't write in your books. And for many of us, we are told this all the way through school because, of course, textbooks cost a lot of money and they don't belong to us most of the time in schools. And teachers emphasize over and over again, don't write in your books. However, when we graduate and leave high school and we go on to university, we buy our textbooks. Here, the assumption by most professors is that you are reading, internal annotation, your books. Unfortunately, many students are ill-prepared for this. Take a look at the example that's provided here for you of what internal annotation looks like. You will notice several things. First of all, you will notice that there are red marks on the page. There's a reason for this. We use a red pen when we do internal annotation so that it's very easy to see. Of course, most print is going to be black on white. And so we use red pen to try and come to certain kinds of information. We want to, in our internal annotation, be looking primarily for main ideas. That's what we want to spend the majority of our time doing with our internal annotation. Okay? But there's a second form of annotation, and of course it's what we call external annotation. External annotation is any annotation that I take which is done on notebook paper. Anytime I read actively, I always have notebook paper out. Always. I will never sit down to read my math or my science or my history or my English without having notebook paper out. It's one of the major mistakes students make when they take an English class. They figure, it's a short story, I'm going to read it. And so they sit down to read it, but they read their short story the way they read their People magazine. They read instead of read. When we do external annotation, we are always taking notes, and that, of course, is some kind of notebook paper, and we're writing down notes. 
you may, of course, already have caught on that we've talked already about a form of external annotation, and that's what we call learning journals. As a matter of fact, what we will see learning journals as is a special way to do external annotation. Of course, the ideal situation, even for high school students, is to be able to practice both internal as well as external annotation. One of the ways this can be done for practice purposes is to either purchase a textbook in a class that's a heavy reading class for you and you want to practice this internal annotation, or to get some kind of copy made of the page and then to practice making internal notes and then as well learning journal notes on the outside. Take a look at what learning journal pre-class reading annotation, is that a mouthful of what, notes look like. Here's some examples for you to see. These were done by my student who I've mentioned already, Anna. And here's some good examples for you of what these look like. You will notice the line is down the page. On the left-hand side, you will notice that there are red ink marks. Now you understand why we're using the red ink. We are using the red ink because it's easy for us to make internal notes in our textbook, as well as external notes onto our learning journal's pre-class reading page. Okay? And then what we will be doing, obviously, is looking to use that information later on in exam preparation. Now, what specifically is required in terms of annotation? What do I mean? Well, you know, I, I think it's important that we maybe work with a word picture here. Imagine this for a second. You're at your local high school watching a football game when all of a sudden from the sidelines outruns a young man who's going to participate in the game. Only one problem, he doesn't have his helmet all the way out onto the field, into the middle of the huddle, ready to go. When they point out to him, you forgot your helmet. You've got to go back and back he goes. Some of us are smiling at this, at this word picture as we imagine it in our minds. But I have students every day that do this. They show up to math class, and the first thing they ask for is, can I go to my locker? I gotta get a pen. Can I go to my locker? I've gotta get my calculator. I need to go and I need to... No, 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 no. We always wanna show up to class prepared. We mentioned this already. So to do annotation, there are certain things that we need. First of all, I've already mentioned it. You've gotta have pens. We want a red pen, and then obviously later for us to do certain other kinds of reading and exam prep, we want a blue or black ink pen. Of course, by the way, if you're doing much mathematics and science and equation work, you're probably going to be working maybe with pencil instead of red ink. That you, you can kind of decide for yourself. Obviously, paper is important. Big key here is notebooks. If you're studying, especially in the maths and sciences, you must have a notebook. This nonsense of writing down some notes, flat, throw, uh, put, folding the page together and simply inserting it somewhere random into a math textbook. Math teachers are smiling as they hear this now. Take out your homework and they see students grabbing one cover of their book and shaking and praying that somehow the homework's going to fall out from the pages. We want all of those days to be over. Out, out, outlining demands organization and we've got to have some kind of organization so we're going to need to have paper and I would say paper slash some kind of three ring notebook. Okay, that's what I would say. Um, also, of course, to do ex external and internal annotation, you have to have time. Many students feel they can get all of their reading done during halftime of Monday Night Football. Well, they read, they just don't what? Right, they just don't read, okay? The real challenge for us is to be able to have silence and time. Those are the two things I talked about before. Uh, good students are always in possession of. We want to make sure that we have both of those. Now, specifically to doing annotation. How specifically do we do, especially, our pre-class learning in our learning journal, okay? The first thing we need to understand, and this will sound funny at first, is we need to understand our textbooks. Many students do not understand the value of a textbook. I will have students who will come to me and say, you know, Mr. McGee, I'm doing terrible in chemistry. And I say, really? Get your textbook. And they will say, why? And I say, just go and get it. And so they bring it in and I say, now, where are your uh, notes for your reading? Uh, reading? What reading? I take notes during class. Is that what you mean? No, no, no. I mean notes for your reading. You are reading your chemistry textbook, right? Uh, uh, well, no. No, I don't actually do much of my reading. Right. Any time a math student says to me, I'm not doing well in math, the first question I always ask is, how much of that textbook are you actually reading? See, most students in high school assume that really 
all a math textbook is, is a whole lot of worksheets stuck together with some kind of cover, and it's not. We will use our textbooks in very specific ways. To do that well, we have to know our textbook. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at uh, some of the um, um, important ideas to understand what good textbook construction looks like. Every textbook will always have three important parts. Now this is important because if you understand your textbook, you are halfway there to knowing how to take good level one or stage one learning journal notes, that pre-class notes that we spoke of earlier. Every textbook has three parts. First of all, all textbooks will have a part one they will call objectives or statement of desired concepts. Every section of every chapter of every textbook, if it's a good textbook, will always begin here. Good textbooks will tell you in advance, this is what you should know, okay? We will obviously want to make sure that we write this information down in our learning journals one stage, that pre-class reading stage, anytime we see that information. Two, there will always be in our textbooks some kind of an explanation of the objectives or concepts. If it's a math textbook, it's going to be some kind of sample problems. If it's a, um, um, uh, an English textbook, it might be the story itself. If it's a history textbook, it might be certain kinds of prose that's there with bold letters, words maybe, that kind of thing that one needs to know. There can be graphs there. There can be maps there. The information that's of primary importance now is always in the second section. And then number three, there will always be at the conclusion of the section some kind of review of concepts, some kind of summary. Of course, if it's in mathematics especially or even sometimes sciences, you will have information in the form of equation problems that you then have to do. Okay? These are three sections of our, of, of our textbook, and it's important that we understand all three of them. Now, what I'd like for us to do is to actually take a look at several of these kinds of textbooks. Let's put what I just said to the test, and let's see if, in fact, it is the case that textbooks follow this type of an approach. However, I'd like to do something real fast for those of you who are watching. If you are a student and you have <coughs> in your house a textbook, I would like for you to turn off the video. I'm gonna go ahead and actually stop the video. I want you to go find a textbook somewhere in your house. I want you to, it doesn't matter what kind, any kind of textbook that for you is a class textbook, school textbook, I'd like you to go and find it and we're gonna do a random test. So go ahead, break away from the tape for a second, I'll wait a few seconds, and then you can come back. I'd like you to go get a textbook, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at your textbook, and we're going to take a look at my textbook here, and we're going to take a look to see, is it in fact true there are three parts? And then we're going to take a look at some learning journals, which will show us how we go from our textbook to our notes. Go ahead and find a book for yourself. Welcome back. Now you have your textbook there in front of you. Open randomly to a chapter. Let's pick two, section one. Go ahead and turn to it quickly, and let's take a look at what we see. First of all, there should be some statement of objectives, some concept or concepts which need to be learned. By the way, some textbooks will provide a list of terms as well which should be understood. Number one, we want to make sure we write that information down. Number two, there should be some kind of now, in the second section of this chapter, some type of introduction of concepts. What we want to do now is to take a look at that information, any kind of a sample equation that we'd be working with. We want to make sure that we are capable of working through the sample equation. It's an inside hit, what I call a good idea. Any time that you work with a math textbook, always actually work through the sample problem. It's a good suggestion. Take your time, just 
try and work through it, try and understand it. Take a look and see in your textbook, in the section that you were looking with, if in fact there is some kind of explanation of a concept. Number three, there's always some kind of review, review questions, etc. You might even do a, a little game. If there were objectives at the beginning of your section, do something very interesting. Take a look at object objective number one quickly and read it. Now look back to the question that maybe is at the conclusion of this section and read it. What do you find that's pretty remarkable? You're right. 99% of the time, objective number one is going to have a question number one that looks very similar. Think about it this way. Good textbooks are constructed by telling you what they're going to tell you in terms of information, actually giving you that information, and then making sure you understand, understood the concept. Our challenge then is to use our textbooks to help us learn. I want to say that again. We want to use our textbooks to help us learn. I have some examples here of several textbooks that I would like for you to look at. I asked one of my students to put together some learning journals over certain textbook pages. I'd like for you to take a look, first of all, at the textbook pages. Then I would like to take a look at the learning journals that Anna has done to go along or coincide with those textbook pages. You will notice that in these learning journals, you will see both pre-class reading information as well as class reading information, class note information that we will be talking about in the next lecture. And you might even see some exam prep as well on the other side of the page on the double page spread. That's okay. For now, what I want you to concentrate on is to look specifically at pre-class reading notes in red. First of all, let's take a look at a biology textbook. Notice in the textbook itself that there are some objectives that are provided, some information is there. Then you will notice that there is some treatment of that information. And then notice finally that there are some kinds of questions asked. Take a look at the learning journal for this page. There's the information, login information at the top with date. Notice chapter 11.1 .1 is provided. You've got pages 261 to 263 provided there at the top of the page. And then there you have some important terms. And as well, notice down below a little bit later, you have a diagram. Notice that is done. You will notice already, and, the, and we'll get there later as well, that there is some matching information that's, that's going on there as well. Take a look at the physics textbook. First of all, to the textbook itself. Notice there's some information provided in the form of objectives. Notice there's some kind of explanation. And then finally, you will notice that there are some sample exercises. You will notice, now to the learning journals, that this information is then provided in the form of a login. We have objectives outlined. We have the most important, important information for the sample problem. And then finally, we will even have some attempted problems in the learning journals. Take a look at a geography textbook. We will use learning journals both in the humanities as well as in the sciences. Notice we will have, again, statement of objectives, explanation of information, and then finally some kind of a review. Go to the learning journals example for this section and you will notice one more time we are following very closely our textbooks as we create our learning journal notes. We will have login information. We will follow then the passage, any kinds of bold information. Notice it is being pointed out. Notice as well that we have a history textbook. The history textbook, one more time, will have the same kind of objective information, information that then will explain the concepts, and then finally some kind of brief review. Notice in the learning journals here that Anna will have followed the same format one more time. Notice we have match information that's marked in the black on the red side. And notice as well the exam prep page, which is on the other side of the page. Anna here is already thinking about how she will be preparing for the exam that we know is sure to come. Okay, this is a brief introduction to the Learning Journal's Active Reading Annotation section. If you're going to do this well, you have to do it quite often. In the last few minutes now given to me, I want to talk more particularly with you 
about reading improvement. There are, are several problems that students will encounter as they begin to read. One of, the, one of the major concerns for a lot of students as they leave high school is simply they know that they're not the readers that they should be, and they know they have problems. Back to the story I began with in lecture one, the student John that we were speaking of, this was one of his major problems. He told me, I was pretty much able through high school to get by without doing a lot of reading. Most of my biology teachers and science teachers, he said, would kind of give me the information I needed to know in advance in study guides and that kind of thing. Now all of a sudden I have professors who give me 150 pages of stuff I've got to read with no study guide information, no idea of what's going to end up on the exam. And for me, that is a major problem. What kinds of reading problems do some students have and what are some suggestions for maybe ways to help them? First of all, I want to talk with poor readers or students who struggle with sometimes their reading. Some students have trouble concentrating. One of the recommendations that I would make is for you to scan quickly the passage to be studied, take some short sections, read and look over the questions at the end of the selection first. This is a good suggestion. It allows for students to have some idea of what's coming. I would also recommend that maybe you pause in the middle of a reading passage and try to paraphrase, put in your own words, the things that you're reading, maybe summarize them, and you might even want to write that information down in your learning journals. Another good approach or strategy, if you do have trouble reading and understanding, is to sit down and read aloud. I've had students who read aloud into a tape that they record and then play back for themselves, or maybe get a friend or your mom or your dad and sit down with them and read to them the section out loud, pausing every once in a while to say, now what I just read in the last paragraph was this. Notice what we're doing there already is connecting new stuff to old stuff. When I can change what I've read into another kind of way to say it, I am learning. I'm doing learning, okay? I would also, um, uh, I would also suggest that maybe instead of writing down a summary of the information, do something more creative with the information. For example, you might want to draw a diagram or a picture. Let me give you one example of how this, how this works. We were studying in uh, Plato's Republic Book 7 recently, and one of my students had a hard time with the concept of what we call the cave allegory in her pre-class reading. So she decided she would try to make a picture of what it would look like. Take a look at what that diagram looks like in the pre-reading. Notice, here we are with learning journals again. We have our login information, red ink, but notice that what we have is some kind of picture or diagram provided to maybe help the student understand a little bit better exactly what's going on. So you don't always, in your pre-reading note-taking, always have to write down everything. You can take a concept and maybe draw a picture to help you understand it even better. Obviously, one other suggestion is to read along with a partner to try and pause to explain information as you're going. I want to talk now just for a few seconds about reading speed because many students are concerned that they are slow readers. It is true that most top students do read pretty quickly, but the question is not a matter of speed. We need to understand this. It's a matter of comprehension. Uh, you can read a tremendous amount of information, uh, but when you finish, you have very little idea of specifically what it is that you read. Okay? I think that's what that John Locke quote is trying to suggest. What we do with our reading is of importance. Learning to not focus on simply particular words, but to see words in groups is a good suggestion if you are trying to improve your reading speed. Maybe try and tr take in a string of words, if you understand what I'm saying, instead of simply reading word by word. But the truth is, really, the faster you read is determined by the amount that you read. More important than speed is the ability to monitor your speed, what we call monitor your speed. In other words, to know when you need to speed up and know when you need to slow down. That's far more important. You want to be able to tell yourself while you're reading, oh, this is really important information. I better slow down and get it. Because we all know what it's like to read 14 or 15 paragraphs and then go, I have no clue what I just read. 
And then, of course, you have to make the decision. Do I go back and start over, or do I uh, decide to do something else? And most of us decide to do something else, then reading never gets accomplished. Finally, I want to mention just a few ideas on developing a reading habit and why that's important. If you are college-bound, I cannot emphasize this enough. The A number one major difference between high school and college is the amount of reading they're going to throw at you. I mean, I just can't say that enough. And the difficulty of reading is going to be so much more extreme when you hit the next level. So I strongly recommend that you begin to read and develop a reading habit. There is as well, of course, the reality of the SATs and the ACT. We have mentioned these tests already a couple of times. If there is one way I know that is a 100% foolproof way to improve your SAT, ACT test taking strategy, it is to begin early on in your high school career reading. Forget about a lot of those prep manuals and books. Forget about thousands of dollars on seminars. If you really want to do well in your freshman year, set a, a plan to read 30 pages every day and try and stick with it for the next three years. You will find yourself already getting ready for the SAT, ACT, because it is quite simply a reading test. It would be kind of like asking a student to go out to the edge of your town and run nonstop for the next 10 months. You would follow along in a car down a few hundred yards and find them, of course, off the side of the road, maybe near death, right? Because they've been running so hard. We can't run distances like that unless we prepare. When we sit down to read an SAT examination, we have to be prepared. And that means we have to, we have, to have done quite a bit of reading preparation over the time that we have been uh, preparing for the examination. The last thing I would like to suggest is that reading lists are important tools. We always want to have certain books for us that are significant. I recommend that you find intellectual models. People who you admire, read them. Read the biographies of them. Make sure that you are spending time trying to understand their concepts. It's a great way to develop a reading list. The other thing I would recommend is, in your reading list, create a broad kind of field of reading selections. Don't be so specific. Try and read in a lot of areas, sciences and maths and the like. Okay, we have introduced one more time to make sure it was clear, the learning journals approach for pre-class reading. We've spent a little time talking about what textbooks look like, and we've also spent some time talking about how you can improve your reading. When we come back, we're going to talk a little about how you take notes. What do I do during class and one of the most difficult things for many students how do I prepare for an exam? Hi, and welcome back. This is lecture number four. And in this lecture, we're going to do primarily two things. One, we're going to talk about classroom behavior and note-taking. And then secondly, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how do you prepare for examinations, how do you take examinations, and more specifically, issues of test anxiety. We'll as well want to discuss briefly how to take standardized tests, such as the ACT, SAT. So first of all, let's go to a discussion of how one should behave in class. In other words, classroom behavior. First of all, I think the, the, the first thing we want to point out is that school is the place where we get the help we need for our own learning. I think sometimes this is true of students who I, who I teach. I think sometimes they believe that school is the place where they do things to me, where they do things to me. We've really got to stop this. We've got to stop thinking about how the teacher is making me do this and school is, is a bad place for me. And we need to begin to think about school as the place where I do things for myself. Does that make sense? That's what we want to begin to think about school as. If you are to learn, you've got to be able to use your classroom time with the teacher to the best advantage. 
So the A number one word, and I've already used it once with, with us, the A number one word in class is focus. We're going to come back to this several times. You've got to be able to focus while you're in class with the instructor. Now, think about what we've already said about learning journals, and this will make sense to some degree. We read before we come to class. Back to the math example, 7.1, uh, chapter 7.1. When we come into class, we already have some idea of what's coming. Remember, that's called being prepared. And we already are showing up with some idea of questions and things like that that maybe we want to have addressed for us by the teacher. I like to think of teachers as helpers, and that's really why we are showing up. So in other words, that's no throwaway line when a teacher says at the end of an equation, a sample equation, any questions. That's not a throwaway line. That's a real question for a serious student. If you don't understand the second time through, remember the first time through will be the night before in your own study or the morning before in your own study. The second time through then will be the instructor giving the information. If you still don't get it, now's the time to ask some questions. We want to arrive to class then early. We want to show up always on time and we always want to be prepared. I recommend always having notebooks for each class or one large notebook for all of your major core classes in terms of academic classes. Show up early and make sure that you have your learning journals open and ready to go. You want to sit in a place as well where you can focus. I have seen students who were themselves pretty good students, but they were able to become too distracted by people around them. And we want to be sure that we're sitting where there's a, there are not a tremendous amount of distractors and one is able to uh, focus specifically on the information. You will notice oftentimes as a student when you're sitting in class, especially if it's a long lecture, or something's happening over a period of the 45, usually 45 to 50 minutes, how long class, classes go, you will find yourself sometimes with your mind wandering, kind of going away, and then you've got to bring yourself back. You want to sit somewhere where you can focus the best always showing as well respect to both the teacher as well as to students. This is as well significant. And of course, you want to sit up and pay attention. I have found that oftentimes students who lean forward a little and nod their head, even, even though I'm not sure that they're getting the idea, are students that I want to teach more to as an instructor. And I think this is true of most teachers. If you agree with an idea, you should maybe lean forward and nod. If, however, the teacher is, is presenting information you don't completely understand, to just give the teacher a kind of look like, I don't quite get that, might be enough of a code. They understand you're listening, they just understand you didn't quite get the concept that time. That is as well important. I always recommend that when you come to class in your, in your pre-class learning journals, that you always have at least one question that you can ask the instructor. And if you feel like that's a question that you want to ask, then go ahead and let the instructor know, I don't quite understand this. It's a good idea. The other issue, obviously, now about what we do in class is the kinds of notes that we take. What specifically should be the types of things that we are doing in class? Most students really aren't very sure what types of things they should be doing in class. Should they be writing everything down that the teacher says? Should they be, um, you know, um, trying to get every little nuance? And the answer to that is simply no. An instructor is always going to give way more information than you can ever transcribe right down onto the page. This is especially true in high school and early college courses. So what we're really wanting to do is trying to get uh, the notes that we really need. Here what I like to say is we have to be selective in our note taking. Now we've already mentioned this to some degree because our pre-class reading information will help set us up for primarily the matching information and the new information that we want to understand. Our goal, again, just to say it one more time, is to keep our head up. We miss too much if our head is down and we're constantly trying to write everything down. For example, you will find often that an instructor in mathematics will actually present from chapter 7, section 7, 1, will actually present on the board the very sample question from the book that you copy down the evening or the morning before in your pre-class uh, learning journals. Therefore, you don't even have to write anything down. Sit back and just watch the instructor work through the same equation that you did the night or the morning before. Okay? I want to give some now suggestions for improved note-taking for those of you who already do a pretty good job of it. First of all, 
you have to learn to know your teacher well. Understand how they present information. If the primary form is in lecture, then you want to try to understand the order that the information is being presented. If an instructor is going to go to chapter 7, section 7, 1, it's not a bad idea if you already know in advance that that's where the instructor is going so that you can, and this is key in good note taking as in good learning, anticipate what's coming next. Good students are always doing this, and of course this drives elementary teachers crazy because as they read the story, what do good students always do? They're always jumping, oh, I know what happened. Okay, this is what good students do. We know that good students are always anticipating. We call this in reading strategy predicting. And we do a lot of predicting when we read actively. Good students take notes predicting. Where's the instructor going with this information? If I've done my pre-class reading journal correctly, I should know if the instructor follows that information along. The other thing I'd recommend that you think about doing is developing your own code system for your learning journals. This allows for you to be able to say with real abbreviated notes, specifically what you want to remember, what you want to mark as match, what you want to mark as new information. Take a look at the example that I'm providing here for you and watch how my student has done, first of all, the learning journals pre-class and then during class is taking notes. We're looking here at some mathematics instruction. You will notice, first of all, that you have, in red ink, you have your pre-class reading information. Notice you have your other information on the right-hand side of the page, blue or black ink. This is obviously new information. The way that we know it's new information, of course, is that it will have been marked as match on the left-hand side. What has happened in this lecture is that the instructor has given new equations, not the one from the book. However, notice something interesting what the student has done. She will take her black ink pen and make a note from her pre-class reading journals, and then she will draw an arrow down to the bottom of the page to kind of extrapolate or extend beyond what was in the textbook. Here we have match information and new information going together. Notice as well across the page, just to point it out, that we have exam prep information as well. The student is already considering how will I prepare for the exam in this learning journals approach. This all now is an example of how to do this type of note-taking note and code language. And this code language is very unique. Find your own approach and then use it. I think the other thing that I would, I would like to point out has to do with new information. We have to be able to decide how important new information is the instructor is presenting to us. We want to know if the information is just kind of uh, an interesting little story that they're telling in history class, or is it something that is in fact going to probably end up on the exam? Of course, freshmen in high school love to ask that question, is this going to be on the exam? Unfortunately, uh, this question is uh, uh, means is code language to me. This is the only information that I'm going to write down. But this is really a pretty good question. We'd like to ask, is this going to end up on the exam when new information is there? We just might not want to always ask the instructor. Anything that we feel is going to be, yeah, maybe it will end up as new information on the exam, that we want to make sure that we place in our uh, note-taking on the right-hand side. I think the other thing I, I've already said to you is I would recommend that you always come to class with at least one good question that you would like to ask. And then make a note here. I would always recommend that this question somehow help you connect some kind of new information with some kind of old information. Does that make sense? So that you're trying to learn while you're taking notes. Go back to lecture one. That was our key. How can I learn? Connect new information to old information to get information that I can, that I can pre uh, prepare for exams for. And that's where we're going next. Because the understanding is, if I am taking in-class notes, typically what I'm doing is I am preparing for the exam. See, we began our whole learning journals approach with the assumption that I am gaining information I can use. I am learning and reading so that I can respond to exams. And so we have to talk now about the important issues of exam preparation. We already understand what we've said, that good athletes understand the importance of preparation just like athletes know 
you do your most important work in the off season. That's where state championships are won. We understand that it's not the recital where one begins to do their important work. It's what we do prior to the recital. And that's how we know whether a student has in fact been practicing or not. It all kind of comes out in the wash, if you will. And so what we want to make sure we understand is that we have to always be prepared for the examination before we come in. I'm going to end this lecture talking about exam anxiety, test anxiety. The A number one cure of test anxiety is to know the material so well that when you show up, you're ready. If you have questions, you lack academic confidence, then obviously the anxiety is going to rise for you. There's no doubt about it. You will want to use the back side of the uh, learning journal page on the double page spread for your exam preparation. Lots of students do this different ways, but my recommendation is that on that double page spread there, at the top of the page, you have exam prep. This is why you will never write on the back page of your learning journals. You will always go to the next page. Login information then will be one next to the login information for the first page of maybe section 7-1. And if you have to continue your learning journals, then you would go to a completely separate sheet of paper with 7-1-2 and then circle. So that you always leave the back side of the page as a double page spread for any exam prep. We saw a few moments ago the training journals, the learning journals, that uh, will, will show the pre-class reading and the note taking. And we also took a look at the exam preparation page. If we want to look back at that page for a second, we will notice that what the student is doing there is trying to decide what will be the primary information provided there. Notice as well there are several suggestions that I will make later that this student is doing. Writing down possible essay questions, coming up with possible multiple choice style or short answer style questions. What could the teacher ask? This will be for us one of our major questions. What will the teacher ask? And to this degree, of course, we're going to try as much as possible to think like a teacher. Okay? We want to know the important elements of what to expect. We have to know several things. One, what type of exam will it be? For example, if the examination is totally essay, that's one style of preparation. If, however, there's multiple choice, if there's true false, if there are short answers, there may be some different types of memorization that I have to do. The key to preparation, of course, is early study. Now, I'm going to talk with you in Lecture 7 about the master schedule, and it will be there that we know how to prepare even better for long-term master schedule issues. If we have an exam on Friday, we certainly want to begin our preparation Monday, Tuesday. I mean, that only makes sense. The earlier we can prepare, the better. I'll come back to that concept. The other thing that's always interesting to remember, and many students will remember sometime in their middle school or high school years writing down a cheat sheet because they decided they were going to finally borrow answers or cheat this way, and then all of a sudden find themselves not needing it simply because they wrote the information down. I, I, I've heard many students tell this to me. We obviously are going to try and prepare for examinations to some degree this way. We will have information written down. If, for example, we know that it's an essay-style examination, we might even write several potential essay questions in preparation. I want to talk for a few seconds about uh, group study and exam prep. We know that good students study in groups. This is true. There's all kinds of research to demonstrate that when students get together, if they do it well, and that's, I'm, I'm going to talk about how we do that well. If it's done well, group study can be a dynamic learning experience, as opposed to simply sitting in a library or at home studying alone, to get together with other students and say, what does this idea mean to you? How does this work? Can you help me uh, figure out this equation? It really does make a difference in exam preparation. But there's a few things that I want to suggest. The first is, you've got to be well organized. For group study to really work, the group has to be together and has to be organized. You want to meet at least twice a week. Here's why. Good groups demand some camaraderie. You got to get together. It's just like a team. If you only meet once or twice a month to play together as a team, you're probably not going to play together as well as if you meet regularly. So I recommend that you try to get together at least two times a week. You want to begin, and this is key, 
begin every group meeting with some written objectives. In other words, what are we going to accomplish in this meeting? One, two, three, four. Write them down. One of the reasons, of course, is that we find ourselves socializing in our groups. Now, that's not entirely bad, and I'll talk more about that in my later lectures when I talk about important learning that takes place not just in the classroom. But when it comes time to study, we want to make sure that we are specifically going to information. And we can do that if we have it written down and then maybe mark it off as we do it. In other words, what problems did you have? What problems did you have? Write that information down. Set some kind of plan of attack. Then I would recommend that you will uh, divide up the workload. So some students will be working with certain kinds of maybe deciding what types of questions, maybe a multiple choice question or two they would make up. A couple of students may be generating possible essay style questions for an exam, everyone studying together. You always want to end each meeting as well with some kind of plan for the future. Okay, we met on Tuesday. When will we meet again? Let's meet Thursday. And what would we like to cover? Let's cover this, this, and this. If you do it this way, maybe everyone by that point will then have the reading done, which is obviously an, ad an advantage. Look, group study does nothing for a student who simply shows up to get the answers. Okay, or didn't read the story and so shows up and says, tell me what the story was about. Not only is, is this really not much help to the student themselves, it's not much help to the other people in the group. So it's kind of important, if possible, the ideal group would be that everyone is doing learning journals. That, that should make sense. If everyone was doing learning journals in the classes that you would be you know, discussing in your group work, then obviously you would have a point of reference. We all come together, we all have our objectives written down, and we make our group meetings then dynamic. Now, this really does work, and students who take seriously group study as they move on to university already have learned how to get together to study. We know that good students at universities study in groups, no doubt about it. One of the problems many high school students have is they're really good in groups, but not study groups. They're good in other kinds of groups. Okay, let's talk for a few seconds about taking examinations, because there's several things that are in importance here. First of all, we want to understand the basics of exam construction. Usually, teachers are going to employ exams to determine if students understand basic concepts. Unlike how most ninth graders in high school think math teachers make up tests just so they can flunk me, the truth is what really is going on here is the teacher wants to know, I have taught this information from 7.1 of the math textbook. Did the students understand, most of the students? So we want to understand that's really the value of an examination. At the early levels, of course, most exam construction is really kind of simple recall stuff. In other words, this is the word, do you remember what its definition was? However, later on, at advanced levels, oftentimes what you will see happening is that teachers will ask students to manipulate or use information. Of course, if we've learned the information, we can do that. If we haven't, we're going to struggle. Proper exam prep, obviously, is the key to test anxiety. If you know the match information in your learning journals and you know the new information in your learning journals, what can they ask you that you are unprepared for? The answer most of the time is nothing, which ought to give you some confidence going in. But there are some good suggestions that I can make to you about how to take tests in general. First of all, if you are a good active reader, then you will be able to be a good test taker. There are two important concepts for successful exam prep. The first is time management. In other words, you've got to know how much time is given to an examination. And the second is energy conservation. You don't want to spend too much energy on a single item on the test and then neglect all of the others, find yourself at the end having to rush to try and get through. You always want to begin an examination by what I call scanning the exam. You always want to sit down and take a look at what is on the exam. Too many students, when they receive the exam, the first thing they do is, wham, go right to the test. They'll start on item one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they hit eight. And they go, whoa, eight is hard. They work through eight for a while and then turn the page only to realize there's 25 questions on this test. They got eight minutes left. Now what are they gonna do? We always begin by scanning the, the examination, looking for number of problems and type of problems asked. You wanna try to predict, how much time is this gonna take me? How much time do I need to give to each problem? Let's take a look for a second at a couple of exams. I will show the exam to you, 
And I want for you to just look at a couple of strategies we might want to use. First of all, let's take a look at a calculus test offered by one of my colleagues at Worland High School. When I asked him about this examination, he said, this is an interesting exam. First of all, if a student were to just begin at the very beginning, they would probably uh, not finish. And I said, really, why? And he said, if you'll take a look at the exam, and it's now in front of you on the screen there, you will notice that exam item number two is divided up into several components, okay? Each of these components are worth five points. So then a student obviously would want to begin with exam question number two. Let's take a look at another test that I have brought in, again offered by one of uh, my colleagues at Worland High School. This is from the English department. And take a look, this is a normal little quiz. Notice that we have several multiple choice to begin with, one through 14. But then notice that 15 and 16, brief essay. Notice 17 and 18, brief essay. 19 and 20, brief essay. Strategy here is obviously extremely important. We want to scan the test we want to figure out exactly how much time we should be giving to each one of the items and then work through the most difficult first. We also, of course, want to think about how to take standardized tests. Now, what are standardized tests? Standardized tests, SATs, SACTs, are tests which cover knowledge accumulated over time and therefore cramming for these kinds of tests is really a waste of time. The key in a standardized test for an SAT, ACT, is to make sure you are comfortable with time. I strongly recommend that you wear a watch. And if your watch has a countdown timer, use it, okay? Countdown timers allow for you to know if there are 20 minutes allowed for this section, you begin to work through this section, and then you can always check your watch quickly to know how much time is left. That's the value of the countdown timer. I only have 11 minutes left. I have 11 items left. I'm going to have to work through the last 11 items fairly quickly. You don't want to get up hung up on just one of the questions that are asked in a standardized test. You want to conserve your energy. Taking several what I call sweeps of the test are a way for you to make sure you get all of the major information answered. You want to first of all work through the section you are working on for the standardized test quickly, answering questions that are easy for you. If you don't know the answer immediately, you just simply want to circle the number and move on to the next one. At the end of the first sweep, then, you should have answered all of the easy, what you will call, easy items. You will leave those alone and never come back to them. Then secondly, you will take a second sweep of the test. And here, obviously, you are looking for those items which you think you probably can't answer. It's just going to take you some time. Again, you want to reference your time. If you can, you want to make sure that you can get through all of those items. The other important thing here, of course, is to know if you're penalized for guessing. If you are penalized for guessing, then obviously you don't want to do it. If, however, you're not penalized for guessing, well, obviously do it. Who knows, you may get the answer correct. You always as well want to make sure to mark the answer sheet correctly. I can't emphasize this one enough. When students start to fatigue, get tired, they will oftentimes write the correct answer in the booklet, but then not transpose it correctly onto the answer sheet. It's a big deal. The other thing is, of course, students often out oftentimes outthink themselves on a standardized test. They think too much about any given answer and they have problems. I strongly recommend that you not do a lot of changing of answers. That in fact what you instead do is make sure that you feel comfortable with the answer that you've given and then leave it as it is. I would obviously get some good sleep the night before you take a standardized test. Obviously get some good, uh, good uh, meal the night before you come. Test taking for standardized tests is major time consumption, energy consumption. And when you finish, you are fatigued, like you run a race. That's what you feel like. And so uh, uh, preparation is obviously important there. Okay, let's talk in the last few minutes about test anxiety. I believe that taking tests is uh, a skill, just like doing anything else well in school is a skill. Unfortunately, a lot of students don't give themselves the opportunity of learning how to take tests because they either will cheat through their tests or they will uh, just not take them that seriously. And then as they move up, they find themselves needing to take tests well, and then all of a sudden they haven't really learned how to do it. So it is a skill. The more you do it, I believe, the better you, you're going to get at it. If you have prepared properly, 
okay, and you come in to take the test, you ought to be able to know that you can do fairly well. I make this recommendation, and I, rec I recommend this certainly for any test that you would be taking. Any time you receive the test, notice, look around the room, what is it most students do immediately? They immediately start answering the test. Some students, if they're even good students, they will maybe be scanning the test. My recommendation is to take the test, set it on the table, lean back, and take a full 60 second, one full minute break. Sit and just shut your eyes and relax. If you have done the pre-class reading learning journals correctly, if you have done note taking where you have proper match information, proper new information outlined, if you have done proper exam prep both individually as well as group, if you've worked through then all of what you believe to be the primary concepts and you know that's what's on this exam, all you have to do is relax and let your mind do what it was created to do. Therefore, taking a minute will focus you and you can coach yourself. Okay, you've done what you've got to do to get ready. Now let's just do it. Turn the test over. One, scan the test quickly to know number of items and type of items. Take a look at how much time you have left for you for the exam. If you're writing an essay, obviously you want to give yourself some time to be able to finish and then maybe even make some editing comments, at least cruise through the paper a couple of times to see if you can find any grammar errors. Notice one more time, tests are tools. They are not for torture, okay? Calculus teachers don't give torture chamber tests. The tests are there to help you understand the concept, which is again why a warrior and a scholar, a top student, can have the exam and the key right next to them and they will never look at it for this very reason. They want to know, did I learn the information? And now finally, in regards to test anxiety, I'd like for you to think about how important it is that after an examination is completed and you receive your examination back, most students look for the grade. Good students look for specifically what they missed. Most good students know what they've already missed. They already know because their exam preparation failed in one area. If you miss on an exam, it's extremely important that you go back to the instructor, that you sit down and you say, how can I make sure I understand this concept? Good students will ask instructors for more items on their own to make sure they understand the concept before they move on. This is what good students do. And we know that test taking and test anxiety will decrease as preparation increases. Our challenge for ourselves, remember the bike example, is to not give up. If we bomb on a test, we find better ways to improve in the future. And the better we do that, the more successful a student, obviously, we're going to be.